so this is going to be a short video in the playlist on medications about the truly wonderful drug paracetamol, probably one of the most well-known and most commonly used drugs all over the world. Firstly, for those viewers who are from the United States, which when I look at my channel analytics is actually the majority of my viewership, uh, the drug is not called paracetamol uh, in the United States, it's instead called acetaminophen. But they are the same thing. So this drug is available all over the world, over the counter. It's available as a tablet, it's available as a capsule, it's even available as a liquid syrup for use in children. So the two main things that we use paracetamol for are as a painkiller and as an antipyretic. So as a painkiller, paracetamol is viewed as being the first line painkiller. So when an individual is experiencing pain, no matter what that pain is, the first drug they should try is paracetamol. And indeed, if you're prescribing a medication in hospital for pain, the first line drug you should try is paracetamol. If that doesn't work, then the next thing up on the ladder for treatment of pain is then to try a non-steroidal medication such as ibuprofen alongside the paracetamol as long as there aren't any contraindications to the patient taking a non-steroidal, such as if they've got a history of stomach acid problems, in particular if they've had a stomach ulcer or a duodenal ulcer previously, you wouldn't want to give them a non-steroidal in that case because non-steroidals increase the acid production by the stomach. After that, if non-steroidals are either contraindicated or if they fail to control the pain, then you go on to weak opiates such as codeine, dihydrocodeine or tramadol if that fails. And then finally, if the weak opiates don't work, then you go up to the strong opiates such as morphine. Paracetamol is usually a very effective painkiller. In hospitals as well, we have the advantage that we can give it intravenously and intravenously it's slightly stronger than when it's given orally. So the other major use of paracetamol is as an antipyretic. So what does this word mean? Well, pyrexia means fever. So antipyretic literally means anti-fever. So when someone's quite unwell with an infection, let's say they've got a bad case of the flu, so a bad viral upper respiratory tract infection, they're going to be coughing a lot, bringing up a lot of phlegm, feeling very unwell. And part of the body's response to the infection is to raise the body's temperature. And this is what we know as a fever. So when body temperature goes above 37.5 degrees Celsius, that is when we say that the person has a fever. So normal body temperature is between 36.5 and 37.5 degrees Celsius. So when you've got a temperature above 37.5, we call that a fever. If it's above 38, that's when we call it a proper fever. You know, if it's just 37.6, that's a very mild fever. Whereas if it's above 38, you know, that's a good going fever. Now the fever often makes people feel very unwell. It makes them feel tired, worn out, low mood. There's a fancy name for this in medicine. So when someone is suffering from an infection and they're feeling really unwell, we call that malaise. It's the word meaning the unwell feeling that someone experiences. So giving paracetamol and lowering the body temperature with paracetamol, it's extremely effective at doing this. Usually if someone has got a fever, let's say 38.7, if you give them paracetamol, usually it will bring it back down to normal temperature. And normally when you do that, it makes the individual feel much better. So it helps greatly with this malaise feeling that individuals get when they're in suffering from an infection. So let's now talk about the dosing of paracetamol. So I've written up here the dosing of paracetamol for adult patients. If I was giving paracetamol to a child, and occasionally I do prescribe paracetamol to a child, I work currently in orthopedics, so we do sometimes get paediatric admissions. So I do sometimes prescribe paracetamol for children. Whenever I do that, I always get up the paediatric BNF, which tells you exactly uh, how much to give based on the child's age. So I don't know that off the top of my head. I always look it up. And indeed, I would say that that's what I do for prescribing any medication whatsoever to a child. I would always get up the paediatric BNF and look up the doses. I don't know them off the top of my head because I'm not a paediatrician. But for an adult, the dosing is very simple. It depends on body weight and the threshold is 50 kilograms. So most adults are over 50 kilograms and therefore the dose that they can take of paracetamol is one gram up to four times a day to make a total daily dose, maximum total daily dose of four grams. Now, the main way that we give paracetamol is as oral tablets or you can have oral capsules. 
and those tablets or capsules usually contain 500 milligrams of paracetamol and therefore we'd be looking at giving them two of the tablets or capsules of paracetamol and they can have that up to four times a day. If however the adult is below 50 kilograms, so a low weight adult and in orthopedics some of the elderly frail little old ladies are below 50 kilograms, in that case dose is reduced. The maximum dose they can have is 500 milligrams up to four times a day to make a total daily dose of two grams. So in that case, we'd be looking at only giving them one of the tablets or capsules that contain 500 milligrams up to four times a day. In hospital, we can give intravenous paracetamol. As I said earlier, it's slightly more effective than the oral paracetamol. In addition, if the individual isn't able to take oral tablets, maybe because they're currently extremely confused because they're suffering from a very bad infection and are delirious, or if they've got problems with swallow, such as maybe they've just had a stroke, if for some reason they're not able to take the oral tablet, that would be another reason why we'd give intravenous paracetamol. And the dosing is exactly the same. So if they're above 50 kilograms, they can have one gram of intravenous paracetamol up to four times a day. If they're below 50 kilograms, uh, then the maximum dose is 500 milligrams of intravenous paracetamol up to four times a day. Finally, as I mentioned previously, there is a liquid formulation of paracetamol. This is a syrup, really. The drug is mixed with a huge amount of sugar or at least some sort of sweetener to make it taste delicious. Uh, and this is often used in paediatrics, so the children don't like swallowing the big paracetamol tablets. So we give them this liquid syrup with paracetamol in. And the classic brand name for this is Calpol, at least in the UK. The classic brand name for it is Calpol. Uh, we also sometimes use this, this in adults as well. So if we have adults who aren't able to swallow the tablets, but would be able to swallow the liquid syrup, then we would use it in that case as well. So paracetamol is an excellent painkiller. It's an excellent antipyretic. It's extremely safe and it usually has absolutely no side effects. However, there is one situation where it becomes dangerous and that is in overdose. Now there are two main ways in which people will overdose on paracetamol. There are deliberate paracetamol overdoses and there are accidental paracetamol overdoses. So in a deliberate paracetamol overdose, the individual will usually be depressed or they will have other mental health issues and they're deliberately going to take a far too high dose of paracetamol. So as we said previously, if you are greater than 50 kilograms, which most adults are, then the safe dose of paracetamol for you to take is one gram, so two 500 milligram tablets, and you can take that up to four times a day so that you and you must not exceed then a total 24 hour dose of four grams. Now, what we didn't say previously is that you should wait at least four hours between consecutive doses. So if you've just taken a one gram dose of paracetamol, you shouldn't then 10 minutes later say, oh, I'm going to take another dose now. That's not safe. That's considered an overdose. You need to wait at least four hours before then taking another one gram dose of paracetamol. In individuals who are going to take a deliberate overdose, they are going to take a single dose of paracetamol that is much larger than this one gram or two tablets. And this becomes extremely dangerous. So as long as you take paracetamol in no more than the safe dose, paracetamol is completely safe and will not harm you at all and will probably make you feel a lot better and help relieve your pain. And compared to other painkillers is much, much safer. However, if you take too much of it, then it becomes extremely dangerous. And the way it becomes extremely dangerous is it poisons the liver. So in overdose, paracetamol poisons the cells of the liver. They all start to die. And this is something called hepatonecrosis. Hepato refers to liver, necrosis refers to dying. So this literally means your liver dies inside of you. Now, I have seen people who have taken paracetamol overdoses. In my career as a doctor, I've never actually worked on a gastro ward. However, when I was a medical student, I was placed on a gastroenterology ward where there were liver patients. And I remember very clearly meeting a patient, an elderly gentleman who had taken a paracetamol overdose and he had killed his liver. And 
it's not a quick way of dying at all. It's not a dignified way of dying. It's actually a really horrific way of dying because you take the paracetamol overdose. They think often that it's going to kill them really quickly, but it doesn't. Instead, what it does is it kills their liver and then they very slowly then die of liver failure, which is not a pleasant way of dying at all. It turns you yellow, it makes your abdomen blow up like a balloon, it makes you go mad slowly, and then eventually you do succumb to it and you do die, but it's a long drawn out horrible way of dying, liver failure. So it is not a good way to commit suicide whatsoever, taking a paracetamol overdose. So how much paracetamol does an individual have to take in order for it to cause hepatonecrosis? Well, the answer, of course, depends on the individual. It depends on their body weight. So if you have an individual with a very low body weight, the amount of paracetamol it will take will be much lower. Whereas if you have an individual with a high body weight, it will take a greater amount of paracetamol to cause hepatonecrosis. But as a basic rule for adults, I have two thresholds of concern. So my first threshold is if an individual has taken greater than 10 tablets of paracetamol. So remember, the tablets contain 500 milligrams of paracetamol. So if they've taken 10 of them in one dose, they've taken a total dose in excess of 5 grams of paracetamol. So that would be my first threshold for concern. I'd be concerned that they are going to damage their liver if they've taken a dose above 10 tablets. My second threshold for concern, which is a threshold for extreme concern, is if they've taken more than 20 tablets of paracetamol. So 20 is a total dose of 10 grams of paracetamol. If they've taken a dose of that or even higher, then their chance of getting severe liver damage from this is extremely high if we don't do something. So what can we do to help people who have taken paracetamol overdoses? Well, there is actually an antidote to paracetamol. There is something called N-acetylcysteine, NAC for short. And this is something that actually protects the liver from the poisonous effects of the paracetamol. So if you give this quick enough, you can spare their liver from the poisoning that the paracetamol overdose is going to cause. So normally when people have taken an overdose of paracetamol, we give them this intravenously. We give them an infusion containing this, which often lasts for uh, many hours. So if given quickly enough, N-acetylcysteine is usually very effective at protecting the liver from permanent damage from the paracetamol overdose. And it itself is actually an extremely safe drug. We do sometimes prescribe this orally to people with chronic lung conditions as a mucolytic. So an example would be in people with COPD, which is a condition that you get if you smoke for many, many years. So let's say we've got a 70 year old gentleman who has smoked for the past 50 years and has developed COPD. One of the components of the COPD disease is that their airways are damaged by the chronic inhalation of the cigarette smoke and they've become thickened and they produce far too much mucus. So people with COPD end up having a chronic cough that brings up all this mucus that their damaged airways are producing. And often they can find it quite difficult to clear this mucus, especially if it's very thick. So we prescribe the medicines that make the mucus thinner. These are called mucolytic medicines and N-acetylcysteine is actually one of these medicines. It's a mucolytic. So occasionally we do prescribe that to people with COPD to help thin their mucus. It's got a brother which is carbocysteine which is more commonly prescribed but N-acetylcysteine is an alternative to carbocysteine. And you can also, if you would like, buy this from um, as a health supplement from health supplement stores. So if you go actually even onto Amazon, you can buy N-acetylcysteine health supplements. If you haven't got a problem with bringing up thick mucus that needs a mucolytic, I don't think necessarily that it will do you any good, but it might interest you to know that it is available as a health supplement that you can buy online. Besides deliberate overdoses of paracetamol, there are many ways in which individuals can accidentally overdose on paracetamol. So I'll give you a few examples of these. So one example is if a child comes across a bottle of cowpole. The cowpole tastes very nice, so the child might drink lots of the cowpole because they like the taste of it, and they've then accidentally taken an overdose of paracetamol. Another example would be if an adult 
say, gets the flu and goes to the supermarket and buys multiple over-the-counter remedies for flu, it might be the case that multiple of these different remedies that they've bought contain paracetamol. And if they don't know that much about medicine, they might think that they can take both of those at the same time. And by doing that, they're then overdosing on paracetamol because they're taking the maximum dose of paracetamol in one and then they're taking the other one concurrently which also maybe has the maximum dose of paracetamol in so they've then overdosed on it inadvertently. This raises the important concept of a staggered overdose where the overdose isn't taken all in one go instead is going to be spread out over potentially days. So when we're talking about deliberate overdoses in that case, the individual is going to take all the paracetamol in one go. If we're talking about accidental overdoses, often these are staggered overdoses. So looking at the example that we've just seen of the individual who's gone to the supermarket and bought two remedies, both of which contain paracetamol, the individual might be taking each of those exactly as it says on the box. However, because both of them contain paracetamol and they're taking both of them concurrently, they may therefore be taking a dose of two grams of paracetamol four times a day to make a total dose of eight grams of paracetamol. Now, if they do this for several days, they're going to be gradually building up the level of paracetamol in their blood to the point that it can then become toxic. This is the concept of a staggered overdose. And I hope you can understand how that's different to the way in which uh, it happens in a deliberate overdose where it's all taken in one go very quickly the level of paracetamol in the blood gets to above a toxic level and it's going to damage the liver. In a staggered overdose it's going to be that they're gradually taking a little bit too much and then the level is building up gradually in their blood until it gets to a toxic level. And both these types of overdoses once they're discovered should be treated with n acetylcysteine to try and safeguard the liver. So we'll end the video there. Thank you for watching. Overall, this is an extremely safe and effective medicine as long as you take it in the safe doses.